make a video about Rublev watercolors, which I'm not sure how to pronounce. I think it's Rublev. Um, because I hadn't seen many videos on it, and I really enjoy all the videos people have been making swatching watercolor. I got a bunch of colors I liked from the Rublev website that I didn't have um, to paint with, and they specialize in historical um, pigments. And so I was really interested to see what they had. They're all nicely wrapped here. The colors that I got to test out um, are cadmium red light. They're dark, they're darker cadmium red maroon. And a couple of, uh, they're cobalt greens, yeah. So cobalt green dark, cobalt green light, and two other greens. They're chromium oxide green and they're Nicosa. Um, green earth. What also looked really interesting to me on their website was their violet colored um, hematite. And I've seen hematite in um, more brown colors, more reddish colors, so I was really interested to see them. A single pigment violet color because those are hard to find. And it looks like they also sent a really quite a big sample an interesting container and it's their um, Venetian red which I expect is a, a brownish red but again it's a single pigment which is really nice and I chose all of these because they're not just single pigments but they're also highly light fast I like to think about all the ways that I would use it in my watercolor and some of the things I think about are the texture of the watercolor paper, which makes a huge difference. So I'm using cold press arch watercolor paper, which is 100% cotton. So it's pretty, I find out more absorbent than other types of um, watercolor paper, but it's not their bright white watercolor paper. So I, I brought out a piece of com computer paper. So you can kind of get an idea that it's kind of this warm, off-white and I find that does make a noticeable difference in how your watercolors will look and because you know we're watching people on the computer talk about watercolors the computer screen that you have at home and then the camera that people film with kind of all change the colors that you're seeing in subtle ways that you can't really you know control for and you're getting a close enough idea of the colors, but I kind of wanted to point that out so you can see how things are different. But besides the background colors of the paper making the paint look different, I realized that even having just a little bit of nickel azul yellow watercolor paint in my um, watercolor <laughs> washing cup was so strong, even though it was barely noticeable, it, it really changed the color of my paint when I went to make a swatch. So sometimes swatches don't always think for the best um, way to look at your paint. Next thing I want to talk about is watercolor paper texture. Um, when I was first thinking about looking at, at my colors, I painted them on some really nice acid-free Strathmore paper. Um, but the thing with the Strathmore paper is that the side I painted on has this really strong uniform mechanical texture. And so this is a Daniel Smith French ultramarine, which I would expect to granulate quite a lot because it's an ultramarine. Um, but you can see the texture of the paper really changed how the granulation flows <laughs> in a really kind of um, unique way. And this is a Grumbacher Academy Ultramarine Blue on the same paper with the same texture. Um, and you can also see a little bit of that interesting granulation pattern, which I think is really neat. But I don't expect this to happen on Arsh paper. So it really seems like when you're doing these 
for your own purposes at home, you'll want to swatch on the paper that you actually plan to paint with. Otherwise, you'll get unexpected results, or you may not get the interesting results you see on certain types of paper. I think this would be really interesting for a lot of different painting styles, this type of paint behavior, but I, I've only seen it on this uh, Strathmore paper. So also in the package from Rublev, um, they sent a really nice catalog of their watercolor papers, which I don't usually uh, see with watercolor brands, so it's really nice to see this. And you do get some idea of the texture in the lift and the tint, but if anyone was interested, this is what their current watercolor um, catalog looks like with with the key in the corner. And only certain of their colors actually come in tubes. And for most of them, I got half pans because I just wanted to test them out. And apparently they also sell um, mixing mediums. So there's more of their catalog. They also sent this, which is really cute because it was close to Valentine's Day, um, that this came in the mail and they have a little quote on the back.
Okay, so it's many days later and the paint has dried over the waterproof ink. And I think the only one that dried really shiny, well, a little bit shiny, was this one, which might be hard to see here. Um, the rest look pretty opaque when they're applied pretty thickly. Even the Nicosa Green Earth can cover up a little bit of the thinner um, ink spots. And all of these have pretty good coverage, especially, I'd say, the cadmium red maroon looks like. It's the same as the cobalt green dark. They both cover really well. And the chromium oxide. You can still see a little bit through violet hematite. And I'd say you could see pretty well through the others. And here's how they've dried on the rougher cold press paper. Look at them up close too. completely dry on the hot press paper and let me bring them up close because I usually like I like to see more detail up close especially when we're looking at hot press
even though um, these granulated, I think with practice, with manipulation of the brush, that they would be really nice for um, water scenes, even ocean water. You'll see here where I was able to get more water-like texture with the gran granulation by dabbing the brush and taking away uh, the pigment also still works well in spite of the granulation for these. The Nicosa Green Earth, I was able to get darker layers by layering. Um, I could tell that the under layers were still lifting up a little bit. I think it worked better when I made the layer more quickly with a fully saturated brush than trying to go slowly. I think the slower you go, the more pigment is going to come up. But even so, all the layers dried really softly here. And what else? I saw very little um, blossoming, cauliflowering, backgrounding. Just a little bit here with the Venetian red. And I didn't really see it, maybe a tiny bit here with the cadmium red light and just the smallest amount with the chromium oxide green, but not with the other colors. I see a, a little bit of the pigment creating hard edges um, with the violet hematite, just a little bit of the Venetian red, and about the same amount for the cadmium red light. I don't see that happening with the other colors, which is nice. So let's compare. Comparing all of these together on the different textures, the slightly different colors, I think this paper is more of a warm cream color um, than the cold press. Um, let's see. So next I wanted to compare these colors to the colors that I already have. Um, I didn't have a lot of colors that are similar to these, which is why I got them, but the closest I could find for the cadmium red maroon was um, Schmincke's Volcano Red, which is uh, much warmer, but it's meant to granulate quite a bit. You can see it's, it is quite a bit warmer than the red maroon. I think the... I can't tell if they have different amounts of granulation or not. I would have to try and put them on the same paper again. But it's possible that this paint has more granulation than the Schmincke's um, Volcano Red, which is PR108. It's definitely warmer. Um, Grumbacher Academy's Perlin Maroon is a little bit on the cooler side than the Volcano Red, but it's still much warmer than the Cadmium Red Maroon. I think this is the one where I have what I thought were the most close matches. These are the warmer colors. So we have cotton and cadmium, um, red, pale hue. So it makes sense it'd be a little bit close, but it is much more orange. And then we have a real cadmium, the Windsor and Newton cadmium red light, which again, it's a lot more orange. And then the white nights, which is a, an affordable brand. Um, Cadmium Red Light, again, another genuine cadmium, also PR-108. I'd say those are pretty comparable. Now these are a little cooler. We have the Coors Pyro Red Light. Let's see if we can put that right next to the color. Um, again, here's another Grumbacher hue, 
Academy Hue. Um, Cadmium Red Light Hue. You can see how different that is than the Compton's, which is also a Student Academy grade paint, um, pale hue, so much more orange than the Grumbacker. Um, here's Grumbacker's Geranium Lake and Daniel Smith's Pyrrole Scarlet. And I'd say none of these are spot on, but if you were to have a painting of a flower, I'm not sure that this would make a drastic difference in your painting. The only difference here is that this has granulation, even on hot press. Whereas these definitely do not granulate at all. I'd say the closest match, especially up here, is a Daniel Smith Pyrrole Scarlet. And at this point, um... I think you would have to compare the prices based on milliliters of volume because um, the Rublevs come in the dried down pans, which I'm not sure, but I think the half, I'd have to see what the half pans of their paints relate to in terms of milliliters dried down, because I'm sure the paints shrink in size when they dry down. But I believe a full pan would be five milliliters, and then you would have half of that for a half pan. And when you compare the prices with Daniel Smith, you might find that Rublev is the same, if not cheaper. So, um, and of course the Grumbacker and the Cotman's are definitely going to be less expensive. I only had matches for two of the other colors, so, well kind of close matches anyway. For the Venetian red, the closest I could find with what I had were between the Grumbacker Academy light red and the Grumbacker Indian red hue. So there might be two things you'd want to look at. Um, are your Indian reds and any type of more earth-like light red? And of course, we can always mix browns from our primary colors as well, but it can be useful to have a single pigment um, that creates a brown for you, especially if you're going to do glazing or you want to change the color of the brown to something slightly different. You won't get weirder mixes if there's lots of pigments in there. I'll leave those there. This is the closest I could find to this green earth, which surprisingly enough is the Grumbacher Academy green earth hue. It definitely does not granulate like this green earth does, um, and it's a little bit more of a warmer color, whereas this has more blue, and it's it appears much softer. Um, no matter what paper you use it on, because of that very soft granulation in the color. And then finally for this color, the closest I had was a Hooker's Green Hue, and that was the Academy Hooker's Green Deep Hue. So if you don't need a green that granulates, I think you could find um, cheaper, closer options for these greens here. So the last thing I wanted to check out was how lighting might change how the colors look. Um, I have a light over here that can change from cool to mixed to warm lighting. And then the rest of the lighting in this room is actually warm. Right now it's set to mixed, and I'm actually curious if I set it to the other settings, if this camera will automatically use its white balance to change how colors look, even if I change the lighting. So I'm going to give that a try. I'm going to change this to 
warm. I'm curious how that might change. On the camera, the warm seems to make the cadmium red light even more um, fluorescent-like or with a higher chroma. And I think that's showing up on camera. Everything does seem to look more warm. And then this is the cool setting. Again, I'm just curious to see how that might change how these look. But I won't know until I check them out on the computer. And I'll change it back. Oops. To a combination of both. When I see people testing watercolor paints, a lot of the ones that I really like use natural light, um, which of course can be warm or cool depending on the season. Um, but it's really difficult to kind of gauge the videos where it's kind of more yellow, old-fashioned fluorescent light, and you can tell that everything's kind of much warmer and more yellow in the entire video, so it's hard to tell what the colors might look like in real life. All right, so hopefully that's helpful to someone. I think my favorite color is the violet hematite just because I don't have anything like it. Um, when I look at swatches of other violet hematites, including Daniel Smith's and some handmade ones on Etsy, um, for some reason I don't see anything like this. And even on the Rublev swatches, I don't really see the full effect, which is why I like. Um, the style of kind of pebble swatching that Natasha Newton started. Um, other than that, I think the uniqueness of these pigments is, besides being more historical pigments, there's more granulation, which you can use as a tool, um, depending on what specific look you're going for. Um, but if you don't think you need that, I think you can find more cost-effective paints that even have the same pigments or even more of a cost-effective um, hue if you're not looking for this type of granulation, which I suspect, um, especially, it's true for me, I would want to practice with these more to get better control over the outcomes. Um, the more I practice with this green earth, the more I like it, because I'm realizing I have more control than I thought I would. And so, yeah, I think that's everything. Um, thanks to anyone who watched. Have a good one. Bye.